you are present, if you bring consciousness to bear, you are better at every single thing you do. You understand that, including relationships and finances and every single thing. It's not just sitting in a corner and trying to enter some higher state of consciousness. Bring your awareness of being into the current moment and be present. It sounds good, but to me those are just words and it doesn't really come all the way home. So I'd like to start with an example because we're not the first people to use the word mindfulness. Let's say you're driving. When you are driving, there are traffic lights. And I don't know if you notice, but they change sometimes. And it is really important that you know that. Do you get it? All right. And, and also, in front of you, there are other drivers. I hope you notice that. And they sometimes step under brakes. And these red lights come on in the back of the car. It's very important that you notice that. It's best that you be mindful when you're driving. When you go to change lanes, are you aware that even if you look in your mirrors that there's a thing called a blind spot? You best be mindful of that. So if somebody's teaching you how to drive, they might use that word. Be mindful of all times of what's going on around you. That is mindfulness too, all right? And it is exactly what we mean by being present in the moment and bringing consciousness to bear, all right? That's kind of neat, isn't it? So you really do know about mindfulness. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because as a young entrepreneur, I struggled to keep my business going. I had no friends, I had no mentors, I had no role models. And the thing that saved me was learning from the success stories of famous entrepreneurs. And in their stories, I got motivation, and I also got strategies for what I could do to grow my business and not stay stuck. And I still need their stories for motivation today. So today, let's get some incredible motivation from the one and only Michael A. Singer. Enjoy. What happens if you're driving and you're not mindful? You crash very, very quickly, all right? Aside from the fact that there are lights, there are other cars, there are blind spots, there are these things called curves in the road. It best be that you know that. That's funny, but do you understand what I'm saying? If you don't pay attention to this, if you are not present when you are driving, it will not take 10 seconds before you crash. Do you understand that? You are not, I mean, forget about this, you know, texting and so on, right? I'm just talking about if you're not mindful, or sometimes I say to people, let's say you're driving and somebody cuts you off, all right? Which is really important when we start talking about mindfulness. It's best that you notice it, all right? Now you're being asked to interact. You're being asked to be present and be present enough to decide what to do. What are your actions? I will ask you, is the, is the amount of mindfulness that you bring to your driving going to affect the quality of your driving? How many tickets you get, how many accidents you get in, and how well you do? Let's say you're a race car driver. Could you use the amount of mindfulness that you bring to driving for driving at Daytona at you know, 180, 200 miles an hour with 15 cars passing you? And the answer is, no, you better not. <laughs> okay, you best bring a lot more mindfulness to the presence. And what that means as a race car driver, right, is that hopefully there is nothing else going on. You're not thinking about the fight you had with the wife. You're not worrying about this or that. You had best bring your consciousness to bear in what you are doing or you are in big trouble. All right? But it's not just in driving, because I'm going to put that aside. In that particular case, if you do not be mindful, you're in trouble. Not just as a race car driver, that's required more. So the more, prof I'm gonna argue that the more professional you get and the better you wanna do, the more mindfulness you better bring to bear. Is whether you're talking about sports, whether you're talking about driving, right? The more consciousness you bring to bear, I like that term, right? I can use it because we're using examples. Isn't that bringing consciousness to bear in the current moment? The more consciousness you bring to bear in the current, current moment, the better you are at what you're doing. Anybody want to argue that? Right, just take the extremes. Don't bring any, <laughs> okay? Let go of yourself. Let go of yourself. This thing you call yourself, your preferences, your desires, your needs, your bucket list, and so on, is just a projection of the stuff you stored inside. Well, what do you mean? If you didn't have it, you'd be filled with love and filled with light. You wouldn't be asking any questions. You'd love having a child. You'd love bringing it up. You'd enjoy every moment of it. If you homeschool, you don't homeschool. It doesn't make any difference. Doesn't matter. Everything, because you're fine. And that's the environment they grow up in. How would you like to grow up in an environment yeah. where it's just pure love and openness and understanding? If they have a problem, they bring it to you. You don't think, oh my God, what did I do? What's it? You just, you have clarity. You can share with them and help them come to the solution 
evolution of cells, right? Yeah. So it's a healthy thing because you're healthy. So a parent shouldn't sit there and say, it's so hard to bring up a child. It's hard because you didn't bring yourself up. up. <laughs> you didn't let go of your own stuff, right? Yeah. And so it's, it's, there's so many things to learn. Yeah. It's all about you evolving as a being, as a being of light, as a being of energy, and keep bringing yourself up and letting go, then you spread that light everywhere. Mm -hmm. That takes care of business. Somebody wanted me to, because I do business, I don't do business. Can you give a spiritual talk on business, right? I generally will say no. Right? <laughs> I, I don't want to focus on, like, like that, right? But the truth is I would give the exact That's same the talk. talk. Right? How do you run a successful business? Let go of yourself. Then you're not making decisions based on your garbage and your fears and your past experiences and all that kind of junk. Yeah. You're bringing good energy into it and it will attract good energy and people around you will work with good energy and they'll enjoy working with you. Yeah. My company, we're technical, high tech, very few people ever left. They yeah. loved working there, yeah. right? And I didn't pay them the top salaries either because we're out here in the middle of the woods, right? <laughs> and basically, you just create an environment for business, an environment for children, an environment for love, an environment for everything you do that brings beauty and love and clarity and selflessness, true selflessness, into your environment. It will change everything. This whole thing about abundance and attracting to yourself what it is that you want and how to use mantras and spirituality to make sure you have what you want. True spirituality is about not wanting. True spirituality is about being filled with joy from inside and then sharing that outside. It's not about attracting to yourself what you want. Is there a law of attraction? People ask me, is there a law of attraction? Yes. And you better be scared of it. Because if it's true that you attract what your mind is thinking, you better take a look at what your mind is thinking. <laughs> In other words, it's not only when you're sitting there trying to attract something to yourself with affirmation. What about your mind all day when it's complaining and it's yelling at people and it doesn't like stuff? What if you're attracting that way? So you eventually catch on that it is not about getting what you want. It is about learning to find out that what you really want is to stay open and not have conditions on that openness. And then it comes down to how do you do that? Are people capable of doing that? Or is that just reserved for you know, some special beings, Buddha and Christ, that have walked the face of the earth? Everybody is capable of that. How do I know that? If I tell you to pick up 5,000 pounds, you may not be able to do that. In fact, you won't. You won't be able to do that. So I've told you to do something that you have never done, and you're not doing it, so you may not be able to do it. But if you're actually already doing something, you're already doing it, and they tell you not to do it. You're always capable of that because you're the one who's doing it. So inside, you are the one who's closing your heart. You close it. You are the one who's closing your mind. You do that. They're your thoughts. It's your feelings. They're nobody else's. So you are in there doing these things. So if I tell you the way to stay open is to not close. I don't teach how to stay open. That's more like finding out how to get what you want. I'm interested in you learning to not close. What a difference. If I say to you, I want you to open your heart right now, you wouldn't even know how to start. But if I say to you, somebody says something you don't like, don't close, you know where to start, right? Because it's happening inside of you and you see the tendency to do it. All I'm asking you to do is don't do that. And I'm telling you that will take you the whole way. Don't worry about opening. Worry about not closing. There are going to be events that unfold in your life that naturally open you, a beautiful sunset, a bird singing. Sometimes you get what your mind wants, all right? You open, great, nothing wrong with that. Don't close. How come it only lasts a minute? How can I see a beautiful sunset? You feel like, oh my God, I looked into the face of God. Then you go right back into your mind with all your problems. Why? Why don't you learn to not close? Once you get some openness, start to work with yourself to not close. And this is how to get what you really want. The, te the deep spiritual teachings are really teaching you how to get what you want. Because what you want is to feel love and joy and happiness all the time. And so if you can get that from within, you then can share it. Mindfulness is about this. It is about finally waking up one day and saying, I'm the boss. I'm in here. I have a mind. I can do better with it than letting it be a horror show then letting it scare me all the time, then letting it remind me of everything that ever bothered me, then letting it worry about what will happen 10 years from now or 20 years from now. That's not fun, is it? Right? If I say you're going to give a talk in your class, all right? A lot of people, the mind gives them a little trouble before that, doesn't it? 
Oh my God, what if I forget my lines? What if I can't say, oh, I feel so stupid. I don't even want to do this. Does anybody's mind ever do that to them? Doesn't that help you perform better? No, it doesn't. So I could just sit here for the whole hour and a half and remind you of how ridiculous it is what goes on inside your head, right? It is worse than an arm that won't stop doing this. At least I can paint, all right? <laughs> and some people sit there and say, they want to sit there and say, but it's beneficial to go over this stuff. Yes, if something happens to you and you make a mistake, sit down, look at it, pay attention, learn from it, then for God's sakes, not for the next 20 years, why did I do that? If I hadn't done that, this would have happened. Do you understand that? You can't tell me there's a benefit. There is no benefit. It's just that you haven't learned how to work with this thing called mind. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free there's a link in the description below go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business I'll see you there basically there are three categories or groups of objects of consciousness that your consciousness is aware of one is the outside world if you close your eyes you don't see the outside world if you open your eyes ah there it is <laughs> okay it, it comes in I discussed in the book goes deep tries to be somewhat scientific so that we fit into an intellectual model because everything is logical and, and intellectual and reasonable. So the fact of the matter is, most people don't think about this, you don't really see through your eyes. Your eyes are sensors, we call them senses, but they're sensors, just like computer sensors that are picking up light, turning it into signals that are being sent up your nervous system, your, uh, Optical, nerve, uh, uh, optical nerves, and then it is rendering it inside your mind. Just like you look at a flat, scene, scrap, excuse me, a flat screen TV, and you look at it in there. That's hard for us to relate to, because we're used, our mind is so intelligent that it creates 3D and depth perception and everything, even though you're actually back in here watching what's coming in. And I like to have fun with people. I say, I'll prove it to you that it's really just light that's bouncing off of objects and coming into your eyes right? Turn off the lights and you won't see anything because then there's no light bouncing off of things. But that's not how we think. We think it turns off the lights, therefore I can't see. <laughs> no, it's because I turned off the light. There's no light bouncing off the objects and coming, reflecting back into your eyes. It's kind of neat, isn't it? <laughs> All right? So it's, it's fun to talk about this stuff. So one thing of the three moving circus is there's an outside world with all of its objects and there's a lot of objects out there. The second is that's not all you receive inside. Not all you're aware of inside. You're also aware of thoughts, which I'm sure we'll be talking about deeper. Uh, so I'll just surface level it. You're aware of thoughts that go on in there. Are you not, right? You, you, you notice your thoughts are talking to you. You notice you can make your thoughts think different things. So you, the consciousness, the exact same consciousness that is aware of the outside world is aware of your thoughts. They're not separate not categorizing it. This is the consciousness that hears my thoughts, and that's the consciousness that sees the world. You can do them both at the same time. You can be looking at something and thinking about it, and your same consciousness is seeing both. And then the third is your emotions, which are quite different than thoughts, and I'm sure we'll talk more about that. But basically, emotions are feelings, they're vibrations that come up they're not, thoughts are thought forms. You can actually see a boat in there. You can see, you don't see words, but you can hear words. They're talking to you, that voice inside your head. Emotions are like that. They're just basically shifts in energy patterns, vibrations that you pick up, but they're very strong and they catch your consciousness. So those are the three things in the three things circus. The outside world that you're aware of, the thoughts that are inside your head, your mind, and the emotions that emanate from your heart. And the consciousness gets distracted by those things. That's, so it's really funny that the word distraction <clears throat> becomes a spiritual word. People don't think of it that way. But deep spirituality deals with distractions. That's what it's all about. If you weren't distracted by your emotions, distracted by your thoughts, or distracted by the outside world, you'd be sitting in samadhi. The consciousness would be able to come back into its source 
when life strikes us and we feel that internal reaction to the external world, it's still what's going on inside. Yeah. How do we release that? How do we let that go? So my experience is, first of all, there are things you can do, but the, the same things everybody else teaches, which is don't hit somebody. <laughs> don't to learn to shut your mouth up. You know, don't yeah. let that express through your mouth because you're going to pay for that, yeah. right? Yeah. So the first thing is a certain amount of self-control, yeah. which yeah. we all need in order to be successful, right? Yeah. But that's not the answer, yeah. right? The answer is every single moment is not the big stuff that you work with. That's too late. It already mm. bothered you. Yeah. It's you got to yes, you have to deal with it. Yeah. Mm. But what I want and what I've learned is there is every moment of your life little things that create little irritations. Yes. Mm. Yes. The driver's driving 15 miles an hour below the speed limit in front mm. of you and you're in a rush. It rains when you have to get out and deliver something. Yeah. Mm. It's hot, it, et cetera, et cetera, right? Yeah. Somebody doesn't say hello. Hey, Sally, how you doing? She mm -hmm. doesn't turn around, oh my God. You will watch your mind mm -hmm. cause serious problems, all right? So to me, that is where the growth comes from, in mm. those moments. Mm. Are you willing to say, come on, what's the cost-benefit analysis of bothering myself about the driver in front of me. Yeah. It's not bothering them. Yeah. I guarantee you, they're not hearing a word you're saying, right? So as a business person, we're supposed to take cost-benefit analysis, <laughs> the maximum benefit for the least cost. Those are 100% cost, zero benefit. Right or wrong. It's all pain. Mm. That, yes. So you don't do it. Yeah. So you learn, and there are lots of techniques. You just learn to work with yourself. Mm. You can neutralize it by saying something nice. You can get a mantra going inside so you mm -hmm. pay attention to something else instead yes. of that. Yes. Or my ultimate teaching, and it's yours also in a sense, is you relax. Mm. You relax. You just sit Take there and breath. say, I can relax and breathe. It's okay that this is happening. Mm. And then what you're doing is allowing the energy to release. The whole idea is you don't engage with it. Yes. You sit behind it and you allow it to release. And not only do you go through that moment okay now, right, but you've actually let some of that stored up stuff that's causing the problem. Like, what is road rage? It's somebody who, because somebody beat at them or is driving slow, has so much stuff inside of them yes. that it needs an excuse to come out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's it, yes. okay? Yeah. So we all, I hope, I, we, I hope we don't all, right? But we all have stuff inside Absolutely. that we've stored over our lives. Yes. So by backing off and letting go in these simple little situations, mm. they matter. It yeah. matters that you're complaining about the heat. Yeah. Mm. You understand that, yeah, right? Yes. It's not yeah. innocent. You're, yeah. you're permitting, sometimes you get very angry about some mm -hmm. stupid thing. You're giving a channel for your stuff to come up. Mm. And you're wiring yourself yeah. to complain. Exactly. Mm -hmm. wrong. Yeah. And so instead, you relax. It's called R&R. &R. You get R&R, &R, relax yeah. and release, yeah. Yeah. right? And what will happen is not only do you make it past that moment without causing a lot of trouble and taking on all kinds of stuff, but you let some of that stuff go. And you yes. get into the habit of realizing, hey, I don't want that stuff inside of me. Instead of asking, why am I not okay? Why am I not okay? You're asking, what do I need to be okay? That's the major difference mm -hmm. of whether you're growing inwardly or you're attached to struggling externally. Is you think I can only be okay if I get the things that I got before or similar, you extrapolate, right? Things that made me I had a relationship in eighth grade and it was so beautiful and she was redheaded. Okay, my, my wife, no, no, it's not true. All right. <laughs> <laughs> she was redheaded and she left, you know, so her parents moved, right? And it was never a bad experience in that relationship. It was just the most perfect relationship you've ever had. Right. You understand now, if I'm grown up and I, I, I go on a, a date and she's redhead, she's redheaded, I have a potence, propensity toward being open. You just asked the question, why do we think we need these things? All right. Because we're not okay inside and we've had experiences. Either a movie, you read a book, it'll tell you you need that to be okay. You watch a movie, meet somebody, you can have a thought. If I had a Tesla, Okay, it used to be a Ferrari, now it's a Tesla. All right, I, I man, everyone would be proud of me and I, I feel like I'm helping the ecology. And so all of a sudden I'm not okay unless I get a Tesla. And mm. if I get a Tesla, oh my God, for a while, how am I doing? Wonderful. So that's how you develop your preferences is through programming. You get programmed by your past experiences. What do you really want? We talk about wisdom, people talk about attracting to themselves, the laws of attraction and all those sorts of things. But the question really is, from a spiritual point of view, what do you really want? And religions about what you're supposed to want, and we know how that works, spirituality is not about that. Spirituality is about looking deeply within and seeking truth, clarity. That's what it's about. 
So this discussion is has nothing to do with my feeling what you should want or you even feeling guilty or weird about what you do want. The question is, what do you really want? And the way to do that, and I'm going to be very bad in doing this, is to say, here's a piece of paper, not really, but figuratively, and I want you to write down what you want. Just take a little time. Don't do it. Take a little time and write down what you want. And if you're like most human beings, probably first on the list is a good relationship, something that makes me feel important, needed, wanted, loved, secure, all that kind of stuff. And so whether you're in a relationship, I'd like it to get better. Someone so should behave in different ways, should understand me better, et cetera. Or if you're not in a relationship, how to find my quote soulmate, somebody who just fits perfectly with me and just fulfills the meaning of my life. And uh, if we're really honest, we write down a nice house and a Ferrari or at least some sort of a car and perhaps children and uh, or perhaps a little time without the children. And we make our list. Nobody's judging. Just be honest. You put that down. The purpose of this discussion is no matter what you put on that list, unless you're very highly evolved, my experience is it's not really what you want. It's not that it's wrong. It's just not really what you want. And the way I prove that is as follows. Let's say you put down, I want a relationship. I want to meet somebody. I want to have that special relationship. And then I would ask you, what if you walked outside after this conversation and all of a sudden there was this bush in front of you and it started burning like it did to Moses and talking to you. And its opening sentence was, I am the Lord, your God, and I would like to discuss some things with you and said enough things that it knew about you to where you were pretty freaked out that you're actually talking to an omniscient, omniscient, omnipotent being, or at least Bush. And the question that gets asked of you is, what would you like? What do you want? I can grant whatever you want. And having gone through this exercise with me, you feel, God, thank God, Mickey, I'm prepared. This is neat. I thought about it. And you say, I want a relationship. I want to meet somebody. I want to have that, that thing I've looked for my whole life. Or I want a house. Or I want the perfect job. I want a job that makes me, f- you know, that, that fulfills what I'm looking for. And what this bush, what God tells you at that point is, I can give you that. I have the power to give you that. But there's a caveat which you probably want to hear before I give it to you, which is, I can give you that perfect person. They will be loyal to you. They will stay with you your entire life. But the caveat is that you will be completely unfulfilled. You will feel sad every time you come into their presence. You will not feel any love. You will not feel any joy, happiness, meaning. But they'll be there, and they will dote all over you, and they will just be the most perfect partner that they could possibly be, or give you the job that you thought would be the most amazing thing, but it's hollow for you. You go there and you thought it would turn you on, but it doesn't. And you just loathe going to work and you're just not excited about it. So therein lies the, what do you really want? Because what you're gonna find is if you were given the opportunity to have a relationship with that person I just described or have the job I just described, but it didn't do squat for you, and it left you hollow inside, you would say, I don't want it. In fact, if it's going to make me miserable inside, I really don't want it. Keep it away from me. And so to move quickly, because we don't have a little time here, then I say to you, you lied to me when you said it was what you really wanted. Because it isn't true you wanted a relationship. It isn't true you wanted children. It isn't true you wanted money. It isn't true you wanted to travel around the world. It isn't true that you wanted, et cetera, et cetera. What's true is you wanted to feel good inside. You wanted to feel love. You want to feel joy. You want to feel inspiration, excitement, meaning. Those are inner things. They're not outer things. You listed the things you listed because you thought they would give you what you really want. And so wisdom, yoga, spirituality, is about going deeper. Buddhists talk about working at the root. So the truth of the matter is, the only thing you need to write, needed to write on a piece of paper when I asked you, what do you really want? is a sense of total well-being. I want to feel love. I want to feel joy. I want to feel inspiration. I want to feel meaning and depth. 
Train your mind, not on the site, but when you're meditating, when you're driving, something. train your mind to say something over and over again, all right? It can be a mantra, it can be, the, when people are into all that stuff, I tell them, just say, I can handle this. Just train your mind to say, I can handle this, That's I can great. handle this, mm. I can handle this. Then when something takes place that tries to pull your consciousness, your awareness into that negativity, mm. you'll find this is still going on, because it's yeah. a habit. The mind's mm. full of habits, isn't it? Yeah. You made a good habit, so now you have a choice. Put your consciousness on the noise or put your consciousness on the repetitive, you know, the, the, the mantra, the higher mind, yes. the higher thing, right? Yeah. And that works too. Mm. So now that you've moved your consciousness, instead of having to change the mind, right, the mind is free to release. The whole idea is releasing. Mm. Because when you let it release, it's releasing the stuff that made it be like that. Yeah. Mm. And all of a sudden, over time, right, you'll start to be happier for no reason. Yes. But of course there's a reason. You're not carrying the garbage inside of you. Yes. And you've got a new set of habits. Yeah, you have a, a habit that are to, supporting to, to you. To relax and yeah. Supporting you, right? Yeah. Yeah. But ultimately, I always get in, it's relaxation. Yes. Ultimately, you can use all these techniques, but when you really are getting there, you just relax. Mm. Keep your hands off. It's judo, mm. yeah. right? Something yes. attacked you, yeah. let it go. Yeah. Right? It's yeah. a whole blade of grass versus the yeah. oak tree. Yes. Mm -hmm. A hurricane can't rip off a blade of grass, but it can break, break, an, break an oak tree. That's right. Yes. You just, and that's what surrender means. Surrender does not mean not doing your best at what you're doing and not being competitive and, and all that kind of stuff. It doesn't mean that. Mm -hmm. yeah. It means are you willing to let go of your resistance yes. to whatever to life is offering that you? One, to what's going on outside, and your resistance to letting go of the thing that's ruining your life, mm -hmm. which is the stuff you stored inside. What you want to do is say what's behind the anxiety. So when, when people talk, I don't help people make decisions, but we talk about decision making, is the first thing that matters is what's your motive? Not what should you do. If, how can you figure out what to do if you don't even know your motive, right? And you, my, you became the spiritual teacher with every word you said about this, which is start from the point of view, do I want to get a house or not? Well, okay, yes, I'd like to have a house, all right? Can I afford a house? Don't worry about what house. What's your motive? It's very simple. You know, it's just, I'm just want to express myself and have a house and, and that's that. And then stop there. Don't say it has to be a certain way. When it's all said and done, if you're afraid of making the wrong decision, who defined it as wrong? You. Well, then don't. That's what Maya was saying, right? If you don't define it as wrong, I was a builder. Okay, you know, I, I, before my personal program, before the program company, I did Built With Love, my co company. I built this house for this beautiful lady, all right, who happened to be the manager of the local bank, and her name was Penny Dollar. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God, her name was Penny Dollar, right? This was a long time ago, back in the 80s. And basically, she once came to me and sat there and said, I'm so scared. I said, look, I, I, I'm going to build a beautiful house for you. We've got it. Everything's fine. So I, I stay up at nights. I can't sleep. What are you worried about? Isn't it turning out nice? I'm afraid. Listen to this. I'm afraid that I will build a house and that I'll go to plug in a lamp and the cord won't reach the outlet. Wow. Wow. Thank you. I said, wow. that's why they make extension cords. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, that's why they make therapists, but yes. The challenges of life are amazing. What's wrong with challenges? We play sports, we like challenges. Nobody wants to play a team that you beat 700 to 1 every time you play them. You want to be challenged. You want to be, have to bring out the best of your being. If you can get clean inside, where you're not being run by all these past impressions, we call them some scars in yoga, but all these past impressions, which are telling you, and they are telling you constantly, you can only be happy if this happens, and you can never be happy if it doesn't, and you will never be happy if such and such happens. And then you go out into the world chasing this, as opposed to working inside on yourself to say, I don't need those conditions. Life is amazing. I'm sitting on a planet, spinning in the middle of nowheres, and there's all these events happening. Don't worry, they won't last. You're not going to stay here. But while you're here, do you want to run around and fight with life and people and places and things and even the weather to try to make it be what you think you want? Or do you want to work on yourself to clean up this mess inside so you can be open all the time? That's what spirituality is about. It's not about renunciation. It's, renunciation is too late. You've already decided that you want something. You need it to be happy, but you're not going to do it. Depth, spirituality, is understanding. You don't need anything. You don't need anything. Doesn't mean you don't do anything, but you don't need anything. 
You're whole and complete within yourself. If you open, there is tremendous joy, love, inspiration that wells up inside of you. The moment you open, the moment something happens that you like, watch how fast you feel joy. And if something happens you don't like, watch how fast you close. That is not teaching you about the outside. That's teaching you about the inside. That openness is where it's at. Closeness is not. Openness is what you really want. Because what does opening mean? It's like opening the blinds. If you close the blinds in your house, your house is dark. It's like that chapter in the untethered soul, take down the walls. If you close the blinds in your house, your house is dark. Now you have to run around with artificial light trying to figure out how to get some light. If you open the blinds, you don't have to do anything. The light is coming in. But you won't open the blinds until you're sure nobody's out there and only the right people are in your house and everything's exactly what you want. You're afraid to open the blinds. You don't feel comfortable. So you either decide to spend your life trying to build artificial light inside or you decide to work on yourself so you want to leave the blinds open. Yoga, true spirituality, is about taking off the blinds, take them off the windowsill, throw them out, and never, ever close them ever again. What is the purpose of closing? It makes you sad. It makes you dark. What is depression? Total darkness, total closeness. You have closed off to the flow of the energy. There is no reason for that. There is no excuse for that. This is your world inside. It's your mind. It's your heart. It is your responsibility to not close it. How dare you think you're going to meet somebody who will overcome your tendency to close? (laughs) What a job. Don't give me that job. You've been in there your whole life building all these impressions that bother you, scare you, and turn you on. And then you say to me as a relationship that it's my responsibility to keep your mind open and your heart open when you're in there closing it all the time. I hope that seems silly and counterproductive. It is your responsibility to keep your mind open. It is your responsibility to keep your heart open. And once you learn to do that, they're your mind and your heart. Once you learn to do that, you will feel joy all the time. And I mean all the time. From the moment you wake up in the morning, you'll be inspired. You'll love to go to work. Even if you went to the same job for 30 years, you don't ever get bored. Why? Because there's energy flowing up inside of you. You will get the most out of your relationships. You'll be able to give the most to all moments that are unfolding in front of you. Why? Because now you're a giver instead of a taker. When we come into the mo- into, into interaction with the moments in front of us, we're looking to see what we can get. We're looking to see how we want them to be. We're speaking to change things. We're dressing certain ways. We're doing all kinds of things to manipulate the moment so that they will be the way we want. And then when they come inside, they'll turn us on. A being who has learned to be open all the time never does that. They don't need to do that because they're already feeling what they want to feel. They're feeling joy. They're feeling love. They're feeling inspiration. So now when the moment unfolds in front of them, they can give to it. They can take this joy and love that they have, and they can then shine it upon the moment people place and things that are unfolding. So this is spirituality. There's always a voice in my mind, oh, I'm crazy. Like, I'm doing something that's wrong. I'm going to be a gigantic failure. Like, you know, people will look at you, laugh at you and all that. But I think those voices are, I mean, you talked about actually in all three books about the preferences and things you like, the, how your, our mind works. Um, I think it's pretty common. Yeah. Have you had those voices and how do you deal with those voices? Well, and I explained in the beginning of the surrender experiment, yeah. <clears throat> that's how I started my spiritual journey is I was sitting on a couch with a friend of mine back in, who knows, 69, 70 maybe. And uh, there was a lull in the conversation. And somehow that's not comfortable, even with friends. You know, that you were talking and then there's nothing to say. And you try to think of things to say to keep, keep the conversation keep going. The conversation about going. feeling comfortable. Yeah. It's really about control. Right. That you have a certain amount of control that you know this person is interacting with you. They're okay. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. All right. Yeah. And so I noticed that that was going on inside my head, that he was anxious, even with a friend. All right. That, that there was this sense of discomfort in the silence. Yeah. And Mickey, Michael, was trying to think what to say. Mm. Now, I, I, to this day, it was 52 years ago, I remember the whole exact moment or where it is. And he's sitting there saying, uh, it's kind of hot out, isn't it? Or <laughs> would you like to get something to eat? Maybe we can get a pizza. Jesse he kept saying these things. Yeah. And inside, I noticed that that's going on in my mind. They all seem very stupid to say. And I didn't say them for the first time in my life. I didn't go along with that neurosis, with what the mind was saying. And then I realized... Uh, who am I that is noticing the mind saying that? 
And as simple and silly as that seems, that guided the rest of my life, period. That moment mm. woke me up to realize, wait a minute, it's always talking, right? As yeah. I was trying to figure out whether to eat or something, it's always saying something. It's yeah. busy judging and thinking and liking and not liking and figuring out what to do. Yeah. But now I'm not it. I'm yeah. watching it do that, yeah. right? I was awakening to witness consciousness, but right. I had no background. Yeah. I had never met anybody. I didn't yeah, meditate. Didn't go to yoga there, and there was gurus. nothing, yeah. nothing. Yeah. It just happened, okay? Yeah. And I'm watching it, and I started to feel I don't want to be that. I don't want to be like that, Yeah. right? Yeah. And so I remember the first thing I said, instead of, do you want to do this? Should we do this? So I'm watching this voice inside my head telling me what to say, but I'm feeling distant from it for the first time in my life. And so instead of saying, when I finally talked, <clears throat> I didn't say, where do you want to go? What do you want to do? Isn't it hot? You know, do you remember what Nixon did the other day <laughs> or something? I sat there and said, I have this voice inside of my head talking. Do you have one? And that's what I said to him. And he was a famous lawyer. He was my brother-in-law at the time. And he was a big lawyer in Chicago and had never thought about these kind of things. And basically, he looked at me and he looked at me strange with this kind of look. And then all of a sudden, bam, this light went on in his eyes. It was so beautiful. A light went on. He said, yeah, I know just what you're talking about. Mine, mine never shuts up. And there it was. That was, and the rest, of all my years, I mean, I mean, it stops, so I don't have to work with it as much, <clears throat> but everything was about that voice. Yeah. All right? So you're talking about how yours was telling you you can't do this. My whole thing from that moment forward was, wait a minute, I don't need this junk going inside my head. Yeah. It's so distracting. It's so negative. It tends yeah. to be negative, yeah. right? Yeah. most of the and time. And so on. <laughs> so by the time I was building the house, I had started to work with that voice. Mm. And this, I started working with it, but telling him to shut up. <laughs> I said, like, shut up, shut up. I don't want to talk to you. Right? <laughs> then you realize that's the voice telling the voice to shut up. Yeah. I took, it took quite a while for me to wake up to realize how to work with that. Right. But at that time, I was not listening to it. If yeah. it said, you can't build that house, I said, shut, shut up. Shut up. <laughs> Which is not the right way. Do not do Suppress that. Suppress it. That is not the right way to deal with that voice in your head. All right? But so it wasn't a problem because I wasn't listening to it. Yeah. So I was yeah. just letting this unfold as yeah. it was happening. Yeah. And putting my whole heart and soul into this is what I need to do to get to where I want to go. Right. So I'm going to do it. Yeah. And there was no complaining, no this, no that. Yeah. So there's yeah. the answer. How important is the slowing down or the relaxation. I think of relaxation, I, for me, I think of it, I've got to slow it down. When it slows down, it doesn't have the bite. It doesn't have the power. I'm able to become the witness. How do you slow it down? And is that an important part of it or not in your experience? I don't any longer have to slow it down. Mm. It, it's, it's like learning to walk. I learned to ride a bike. You yeah, go now it's through automatic your, for you. It take you different stages, right? Yeah. So first, in, in the book, there's a chapter called, Oprah said it was her favorite chapter. It was called Let Go Now or Fall. Yes. yes. The moment is very much what you were talking. The yes. moment you see, like anger doesn't happen all at once. Mm. It starts like it starts yeah. down there. Mm -hmm. You understand yeah. that? That's when you have to deal with it. Yeah. You have to yes. be sincere enough to say, I don't even want to know what I'm about to get angry about. Yes. I know that that's not a part of my being. I need to listen to. All right. right? right. So when it starts, you relax. Right. It's that commitment. To relax, you relax your shoulders, relax your chest, relax your tummy. It doesn't take time. It's not mm. like it's not like you have to put aside time to do this, yeah. right? You just have to be conscious and yes. be, be, be committed, right? Yes. So you relax it and you lean away. Mm. You just lean away from the noise, mm. right? And you actually don't realize that at first it feels good because you didn't get angry. You didn't get all yes. involved or yeah. neurotic or whatever react, it was, yeah. right? You react. But you're actually leaning into a deeper part of your being mm. when you lean away from the lower part of your being, mm. right? And I, I want to do one little thing because a lot of your people are are very successful, obviously, they, they work with you. So they get successful, right? And I often have people say to me, I don't want to give up the fear. I don't want to give up the anger. It's what drives me. Mm. It's what I use. Come on. You it's know, an old you strategy. You know, they say yeah, that, yeah, right? No, I, it's what I use to be successful, right? Mm. If I give that up, why would I get out of bed in the morning? Mm. They actually ask that, right? Oh, no, and what, what you're missing is, for one thing, there are lots of things you can use, drugs, all kinds of things, please don't, all right, <laughs> that temporarily or momentarily can give you some energy, yeah. right? But they will destroy you. Yeah. Anger will destroy you. Fear will destroy you. They burn out your adrenals. They burn out your system. You understand? Yeah. So it's not a long-term solution. And this question of if I don't have that to drive me, 
why would anything drive me, right? Have you ever fallen in love? Who's ever fallen in love? Do you find that you're driven to be with the person? Do you find you want to get things for him or her? Do you find, right? Yes. Love is a motivator, way greater than fear or, yes. or anxiety yes. or, or any of that kind of pain, yes. you know, anger. Love motivates you to give and express itself. Love wants to express itself. So what happens mm. is when you let go of this lower stuff, you yes. start noticing love starts to come up. You mm. start yeah. to open up to the higher energies. Yeah. Yeah. One opportunity that always presents itself constantly in a workplace is perfecting your interaction with other people. It's a relationship, just like your personal relationships that you have at home. You have relationships with every single person you're interacting with, and we need to learn to perfect those. And by perfecting those, we perfect ourselves. Why? What happens naturally, as we've discussed earlier, is we've had experience in our lives. Those experiences have carved you. They've carved your sense of good and bad and, and what you like and what you don't like, what you're afraid of and what you desire, etc. These are not things you decided. They are things that your environment and your experiences left these impressions. These impressions got left on top of you. So now what happens is when you look out into the world, what you see is yourself. You know that, you've all heard that before. So you look outside because you're looking through the glasses of your own personal experiences everything looks that way. Well, that's not a good foundation for working with other people. And what you're gonna find out is that you become very critical of other people. So if you're a boss, when you look at other people, you think that your employees, they should be doing things the way you thought, the way you do them. So what it comes down to is, how do I use my interaction with the people in my workforce, in my workplace, to perfect myself so that I learn how to get along with people that are different than me? The beauty of when you go home, there's a handful of people, you know, one, two, three, your family. When you go to the workplace, there's lots of people. And so you get this tremendous opportunity to learn how to work with diversity. People are diverse. So how do I go about working with people? First, you start by neutralizing yourself. You realize that your view of how it should be done, what everything is, is just your view. So you try to listen to what other people are trying to say through their actions about how they would go about doing it. Now. I could give you a nice talk about how everybody has contribution, everybody has something to give, and just give them an opportunity. Let's say you're past that. And what you see is that things are not being done in a way that is constructive, or ultimately constructive, or ultimately efficient. You're the boss, you're somebody in a position, that's your responsibility, to get things running as good as possible, as, as even as smooth and effective as possible, efficient as possible. So how do I deal now with a person who's going about their business and it's not coming out that way? I look at it as an opportunity to perfect the universe. It is not something against the other person. I'm not criticizing the other person, even within myself. They're not doing anything wrong. The universe created them. They are the result of everything that caused them to be the way they are. Everything's that way. And I've now been put in a position where I can help to raise the universe to help it run more smoothly, help it run better. So you start off with a constructive view that if something is not perfect in front of you, that's a good thing. That's an opportunity for you. It doesn't get you upset, doesn't make you frustrated, doesn't make you angry. Therefore, when you approach the other person, you're not putting them on a defensive point of view. If you cause defensiveness in another person, you've not done your job because nobody does good based on defensive or fear. That is not a foundation for good work. So basically you approach it from the point of view of that person is me and I have these blockages, I have this inability to see something. How do I work with myself? How do I change this? And a lot of times you'll end up working with the person not even about the thing that you want to talk about. You start working at another level with the person and help them work through what issues they have that are causing them to be the way they are. And it becomes a friendship. It becomes a beautiful experience. You find that your entire interaction with every single person in your life is giving. You are serving. That's all you're doing. It is your job to help it be the best that it can be. They're not serving you. I'm CEO of a company with all these people. They're not serving me. I'm here to serve them. I'm here to help them be better. Once you get comfortable being with reality, this is very deep. This is what Lao Tzu tried to talk about in the Tao. Now that you are willing to let go of yourself, your personal self, and 
interact with reality, your awareness is now experiencing reality, you will find that there's not one single moment that unfolds in front of you that is not calling to you to interact with it. It is there, you are there, because you are meant to be with each other. That's how perfect it is. It's like the most perfect relationship. People are looking for their soulmates. It's right in front of you. It's called life. It is the most perfect fit for your being. That's why you're there and it's there. And you will feel it and you will know what to do. I'm telling you, you will never, ever have trouble making a decision again for the rest of your life. You will never wonder. You will never have any angst or anything. It'll just be the universe. It's sort of like, listen to me, you're on the ocean on a surfboard. How do you know when to go up and when to go down? You don't. The wave does it for you. You just ride the wave. The wave comes up, you go up. The wave goes down, you go down. But what if I want to go down when it goes up? You fall. What if I want to go up when it goes down? You fall. It's like you just interjected yourself into a system that you're supposed to be in harmony with. And if you are in harmony with it, you will know exactly what to do because it's telling you what to do. It's not telling you with words, but it is telling you what to do, isn't it? It's telling you what to do. It's go to the right, go to the left, feel it, be in harmony with it. That's how you ride a wave. That is the Tao. That is what Lao Tzu was talking about, how you ride life. If you're not busy in there wanting it to be other than it is, then you are in harmony with what it is. The moments know where they're going. They're part of a harmony that's moving through time and space. You are here to experience that and participate in that. You don't have to do anything. It is happening to you. You're happening with it. And then you're going to see that what happens, you start just being with it. And everyone looks at you and says, oh, you're so good at everything you do. You're not doing anything. You're not doing a single thing, but you're neither doing nor not doing. That's the deepest of all the teachings. You are there with it. It's doing something. The ocean is doing something. So obviously, if you're on the ocean and the ocean's doing something, it looks like you're doing something. Do you understand what I just told you? is the entire Bhagavad Gita. It's the deepest teaching you will ever even come close to. Everyone will think you're doing things. You're not doing a single thing, but you're also not not doing either, right? You are just being on the ocean and being with it, and the ocean knows where it's going. Therefore, you will be the one who's in harmony with everything. It's so simple that we miss it. If you want to play baseball and you want to pick up a grounder, I do not think that what you should be doing is guessing where it's going to go next. You should be watching it. Why? Because it knows where it's going next. You see, that seems so weird. You're the smart one. You should be the one who can figure it out. I guarantee you right now, that ball knows more about where it's going than you do. The ground and the ball ball and the interacting with them knows way more about what's going to happen next than anything you're going to figure out. That's why they say, keep your eye on the ball. They don't say, keep your eye on your mind. They don't say that. They say, keep your eye on the ball in every sport. Why? Because the ball knows where it's going. It just, it's the forces of nature. Therefore, it knows where it's going. It is perfectly in harmony with all the forces that it's interacting with, isn't it? So if you keep your eye on the ball, you have a better chance of being where it's going because you're paying attention to where it's going. You're not guessing. You're not figuring. You're not using logic. You're not worrying. You're not angsting. You're not hoping. You're not praying. Even a good religious coach, if you say, coach, when the ball is hit, should I close my eyes and pray that I get it? Or should I watch the ball? They're going to tell you to forget the praying stuff at that time. Pray that you can keep your eye on the ball. All right. You are supposed to keep your eye on the ball. And it's the same thing with life. I'm telling you, it's exactly the same. You come into harmony with the moments that are unfolding in front of you. Well, why would I do that? I'm not even going to answer you if you sat here this long because they are the moments that are sitting in front of you. But if I don't like them, it has nothing to do with like and dislike, does it? It has to do with dancing with it. What if I don't like what the waves are doing? Then don't surf because you're going to fall. And it's the same way with life. I'm here for a little while on the planet Earth. Just a very little time, a few years. And I get to see, I don't get to see much. <laughs> it's really embarrassing. I only get to see the little tiny bit that's in front of me in a given moment and I miss everything else. You understand that? Those of you who think you know something, you don't know anything. Here's a book. It's just the most brilliant book. Read one word. Give me the book back. Do you know the book? Here's a moment in life. There are 700 billion quillion going on at the same time. You saw one, you know what's going on? No, you don't know what's going on. You don't have the slightest idea what's going on. You only know what you picked up. I told you, statistically, what you picked up is statistically insignificant. In fact, it rounds to zero. Point oh, 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 oh. Am I right or wrong? You see it? So therefore, what you picked up can't be anything. It's nothing. It's zero. 
but you think it's everything. And to you, it is everything because it's the only thing you picked up. <laughs> Your universal set is like nothing. It's just, God, I'm trying to talk to you intelligently. So the right way to come into the moment is to sit here and realize I'm a conscious being. That's a blessing. How it came from, I don't know, but I'm here. I know I'm here and I'm conscious. And there's this moment unfolding in front of me. I am well aware that there are 700 billion zillion going on everywhere that I'm not experiencing, but I can't do anything about that. Let me at least experience the one I'm experiencing. Wow, it's kind of neat. Let me at least experience what I'm experiencing. It's like a gift. This is the gift that's being given to you. There's another gift being given to everybody else. There's seven billion people on the planet Earth. Every single one of them experience something different every single moment. That's what they're experiencing. That's the gift that's being given to them. And so you actually come into the moment, I'm afraid to say it, with a sense of honor, with a sense of respect, with a sense of gratitude. You sit there and say to the moment, wow, thank you. This is the one I got to experience. It has nothing to do with what I want, what I don't want, or what should be, or what shouldn't be. It has to do with my humility of realizing I'm not the creator of the universe. I am the experiencer of this moment. That's what I am. There are forces that are creating the universe. You do know that. You want to call them science? I love it. You want to call it God? I love it. It makes no difference. Just call it not me. That's the nicest name for the creator of the universe, not me. Because you know it's not you, don't you? <laughs> okay, you're just kind of sitting here picking up the moment that's in front of you. Then honor and respect that experience. You start by honoring, respecting, and accepting the blessing and the reality and the right of what is unfolding in front of you. If you don't like it, you look at that as disharmonious. You let go of yourself. And that's, Christ said, you must die to be reborn. That's what we're talking about. You literally do the process. Don't get mad at yourself for being a certain way. Just don't participate in that part of your being. You don't have to get mad at your hand because it wants to pick up a cigarette. Just don't pick up the cigarette. In fact, if you get mad at your hand, you'll probably be so stressful, you will pick up the cigarette. Then you definitely need a cigarette. It's the same thing with drinking. Just don't do it. Don't get mad. Don't do anything. Just don't participate in the process that will not take you where you want to go. So if you find yourself making up an alternate reality, I am begging you to just let it go. If you find yourself not liking the reality that's unfolding in front of you, I am begging you, relax and let go. All right. That's not the end of your relationship with life. That's the beginning of your relationship with life. Your mind is a very great thing. It is brilliant. It took metals and sand and taught the sand to think in silicon and took metals and made a rocket ship, got inside and flew to the moon. <sighs> oh my God, you are brilliant. <laughs> you have a brilliant mind, okay? That's not the problem. The problem is what you're doing with it. When you go to that brilliant mind, you say, I'm not okay because I store all this junk inside of me. Figure out how everybody else needs to be so I can be okay. That is a total misuse of mind. Stop it. That's what you do. <laughs> that's, what you, that's your technique. Stop doing that. Don't use your mind for that. That's the personal mind. Don't, don't use your mind for that. Use your mind for great things. Don't use your mind for sick things. Well, but then what do I do about the fact that I'm not okay? Fix it. Don't make everybody else be different so you can be okay. Don't have all these rules of how everything needs to be so you feel better. Find out why you're not okay. How's that? Buddhists say work at the root. That's the root, right? Well, why am I not okay? I told you, you just weren't listening. You're not okay because you shoved all this stuff inside of you of every single experience you ever had in your life that bothered you, that you weren't comfortable with. There are going to be things that are not comfortable. You see a rattlesnake all coiled up, rattling. Oh, that's not comfortable. I promise you I've seen him. All right? It's, it's, that's supposed to scare you. You understand? That's why he's doing it. It's not wrong. It's not bad. It didn't ruin your life. It's a heck of an experience, in fact. Does that mean I should go pick it up? No, you respect the experience you're having, and then you let it pass. You're a greater being because you had that experience. Every experience you have makes you a greater being because you had the experience. I don't know how to explain that to you. Why do you practice tennis? Why, why do you, when you practice tennis, do you just have the ball, the you know, ball server, the automatic server, do you just have it come exactly where your strength is every single time so you can get better at where you're strong? No, you hit it all over the place. Why? Because every single angle you get better because you use those muscles and because you came in tune, right or wrong. Practice makes perfect. Well, if practice makes perfect in sports, why does practice not make perfect in life? Experience is your best teacher. Therefore, every single experience you have, you have it and it passes through you. Don't hold on to the rattlesnake so that you miss the next experiences. Honor and respect the experiences you had. Everyone, the divorce, the this, the children, the traumas, I don't care. I'm serious. Stop it. 
You're not a victim. You're somebody who received the gift of experience. How's that? The fact that it wasn't comfortable, well, the rattlesnake wasn't comfortable. Fine, that's part of the experience. Let it go. I'm glad I had that experience. Now I know better about rattlesnakes. I met one, <laughs> okay? Um, I, I know how to deal with it. Well, okay, fine. You met divorce. Your parents got divorced. Wonderful. You win. The person whose parents didn't get divorced, they lost. They didn't get to have that experience. That's how you have to look at it. Every single experience you have is its weight in gold. It's a gift from God. And it's your gift because nobody else had your experience. So you process these. Let them go. That's your spiritual path. If meditation helps, meditate. If mantra helps, do mantra. But the purpose is not meditation or mantra or any of the other techniques. The purpose is, are you willing to stop storing inside of you the things that were difficult when you had the experience? Because otherwise you store difficulty inside of you. It's going to be there all the time. You understand that? If you have a bad smell, don't collect them and take them home so you put them in a room and remember how bad it was and how much you didn't like it. Just let it pass. Open the windows or don't. I don't know what to do when I get a skunk. I always forget. But just let it go and it'll be over. It'll pass. Don't never drive down that road again. Don't. You hear me? Let your experiences pass and they will have fed you. You'll become a whole person because you had them. You don't need to hold them in your mind. That is spirituality. And now I showed you why spirituality and life are the same thing, aren't they? That's the highest way to live your life. That's the highest way to become spiritual. So find a way to work with yourself inside instead of trying to use your mind to avoid yourself. Don't let your mind say how you want things to be or not. It's so foreign to people. Don't. I want things to be the way they are. And what I want is to be able to honor and respect the reality of the moment in front of me. That's the last want that gets left. That's your work. And you work on that one, it's over, isn't it? So little by little, work with the things that are unfolding in front of you. Don't store them, honor them, respect them, let them pass. And because you're not putting more stuff down there, the old stuff will come up by itself. I promise you, don't worry, it will. You'll come complain. The old stuff will start coming up, let it go. Let it go. You do not want any of it in you. Let it go. If it needs to come up, let it welcome it. Sing. Hey, come on up. You're welcome here. Kiss it. Throw a party. Really. I'm telling you, the worst stuff you have in there, welcome it up. Just relax and release as it comes up. And it'll go. It'll pass. Not all at once, but it'll pass. And wait till you see. I'm telling you, your, your energy will become free inside. You'll wake up in the morning with ecstasy pouring through your being, not worries about what happened. And then all through the day, it feeds you. It rises up inside of you, feeding you all the time. That's what your life's supposed to be like. Karma yoga is about everything else. That's why karma yoga is the deepest yoga. It's not about your relationship with your body, with your heart, with your mind, or even with your higher bodies. It's about your relationship with the rest of the world, with the rest of what's unfolding in front of you. How do I interact with the reality of life that keeps manifesting before me? That is the topic of karma yoga. And it's often considered the deepest yoga because it is so expansive in one's life. In fact, one of the deepest spiritual scriptures in yoga, the Bhagavad Gita, is considered a treatise on karma yoga. So what is karma yoga? What is our relationship with the world around us? In order to understand that, to begin to truly understand that, you have to understand two things. One, who are you? Who's in there looking out? What is the nature of your being that has a relationship with the world around you? And the second is, what is the nature of the world outside of you? The first is actually quite simple. You are the one who's in there looking out. This is what the essence of witness consciousness, and Krishnamurti used to talk about objective observation. You are the indwelling being who looks out through your eyes, hears through your ears. You are the one who knows you have a body, you were the one that was in there when you were six years old, and when you looked in the mirror, you saw a six-year-old's body. Now you see whatever age you are, and it will continue on. You are the consciousness, the awareness of being. You see the emotions that are coming up from your heart. You see the thoughts that are created in your mind, and ultimately you experience great love and sometimes bliss as you get deeper within yourself. It's all the same you. There's just one of you there. That's you. Well, what is the nature or the reality of the world outside of you. That is one of the most fascinating and beautiful topics. If you turn to science, they will tell you that 13.8 billion years ago, there was this big bang. 
And subsequent to that, there were these thick gases of hydrogen and helium <clears throat> that fused together based on gravity and built the universe as you know it. A wise person realizes that every single moment of their life, what is unfolding in front of them is the result of 13.8 billion years of the universe unfolding and evolving until it finally landed at their doorstep and presented the moment that's in front of them to them. So the world outside of you is not of your own making. The world outside of you belongs to science, belongs to God. It belongs to evolution. It belongs to cause and effect. It is indeed the moment in front of you took 13.8 billion years to get there. You can't call it your own. You didn't make it. You weren't even here. The other way to know that the world outside of you has absolutely nothing to do with you, it belongs to itself, is to realize that the moment in front of you is no different than the moment to your left or the moment to your right or the moment behind you or the moment anywhere else in the universe. The universe is expressing itself everywhere. You're just seeing one particular moment, one particular point. You can't say that because it's the part that you see there's something special about it. It's just the part that you see. So a wise person comes to the point of realizing that they are inside looking out. What is outside is the result of creation. It is not theirs. It doesn't belong to them. It is just passing by, and they just happen to be seeing that moment. So karma yoga raises the deep question, what then is my relationship to the world that's unfolding in front of me? If it doesn't belong to me, and it doesn't, again, let's spend one more moment with that. If I picked you up out of the moment you're in and dropped you onto a street in Paris, then that would be the moment you see. Obviously, that moment was there before you got there, and if I take you away, the moment will be there after you leave. It has absolutely nothing to do with you. Eventually, a wise person realizes that is true of every moment. If I walk in a restaurant, that restaurant existed before I got there. It was going on. The people were there. Conversations were going on. Music was going on. Whatever food was going on. I then step in. I'm just seeing a moment that already exists. When I step out, the moment will keep going on. It doesn't belong to me. It belongs to itself. It belongs to science. It belongs to God. It's such a beautiful thing to see that the world outside of you exists independent of you, but you are experiencing one particular moment of it. The world has its ebb and flows. It has its cycles. And it should have its cycles. And you do not understand those cycles, and you will never understand those cycles. How could you possibly? If you only see this tiny bit of life, it's a whole. Its cycles are in harmony with its universal self. You only see the way when it passes by. You say, oh, I shouldn't be doing that. Why? Because it messed up my face in the reflection. That's why. You'll always do it in relationship to you. You want to know how wrong you are? Every single time you say something's good or bad or right or wrong or better or worse or preferred or not preferred, I'm going to ask you based on what. Every one of those things are relative terms. Good, bad, right, wrong, preferred, not preferred. Those are relative terms. She doesn't agree. She doesn't agree. Everyone's got their own thing, don't they? They're relative. And I'm going to ask you based on what. And if you're honest, you're going to say based on me, based on my view of the world, based on my value system. So what? Who cares about your value system? There's Narcissus again. There you are looking into the universe and seeing the reflection of yourself and saying that's what matters. So it's, you just get to the point where you stop putting so much weight on yourself. Stop being Narcissus. Your face is just one of 700 billion things in the universe. Your spiritual journey is about ceasing to think that you matter. It is about ceasing to think that you are the center of your universe. The universe is the center of the universe. It's about lake, not about face. It just keeps coming back to the same thing. You have to wake up to that. So your spiritual growth is not about getting into yourself or changing your views or ugh. even to go in there and mess around with your mind is crazy. Your mind doesn't matter. It's a nothing. You know how long it takes to erase a hard disk? Just take a good magnet, pass it across, it's gone. So it's just meaningless what you have in there. Stop rearranging the darn thing. What matters is life itself, God, the universal. Get to know her. How? By ceasing to be so interested in yourself. So when you look into the lake of life, 
And that's what you're doing every minute of every day. You understand that? You're looking into the lake of life. When you look into the lake of life, will you please stop seeing yourself? There's lots and lots and lots of things out there. Stop seeing yourself. How do I know that I'm seeing myself? I will give you the biggest clue that ever was. It offends you. You feel a change in the force in the energy, in the Shakti flow. Sometimes you do, don't you? Like lots of times. If you look out into this lake of life and it causes a change in the flow of the chi inside of you, you have projected yourself into life and it hits your projection. I want this to happen. I want that to happen. The cause of suffering is desires. Buddha. It's all the same teaching. You are projecting from inside out. Therefore, the innocence of life is hitting your projections, causing you to suffer, causing change to happen inside your peace. It's disturbing the peace. You want to stop that? You want to find true spirituality? You have to let go of projecting yourself onto life. What is love? Shakti, the energy rising up to the fourth chakra and pouring out the fourth chakra. That's what you call love and the tuning with somebody who you like. <laughs> if, if, if they talk the way you want, dress the way you want, act the way you want, et cetera, et cetera, you open and then the energy can come up and you feel this experience of love. Well, what if you're not closed? What if you never close? Then it's all love. You know what it should take for you to feel love anytime you want? Just wave your hand in front of your heart and bliss pours through your heart all the time, anytime you want. That is what it means to reach a state of happiness, a state of pure, unconditional happiness. It's inside of you. It's available to you. I would love to feel that what we talk about today and what you end up doing with it can help you be the best at whatever you chose to be. Because what we're talking about, it's your choice what you choose to be, all right? And you have a lifetime to do it. But there are things that can help you be that. And one of those, like I said, the most simple level is you take decent care of your body. If you don't take decent care of your body, it doesn't do well, does it? And when it's not doing well, you can't do well. You can't go to work, you can't concentrate, and so on. I want to talk about what mindfulness really is. It gets pigeonholed into different things. It really is about saying, can we have a discussion about what you're doing with your mind? There, that's mindfulness. Be mindful of what you're doing with your mind. So what does that mean? You raise your hand, you say to me, well, I use my mind to study. I say, wonderful, great. I hope you do well at it. I use my mind to do research. I'm into research. Wonderful. That's a great thing to do with your mind. I use your mind. I love to read and learn about history and whatever it is that you are doing with your mind, be mindful of what your mind is doing or you're going to be in big trouble. What is your mind doing? It's really very, very easy. I guarantee you, it takes you 10 seconds. You won't like what you see. What you're going to see is that when you are not using your mind, when am I not using your mind? When you're driving down the road, going somewhere, when you're sitting on the potty, whatever you want to call it, right? All the moments you take in your life where you are not consciously doing something, I guarantee you there's something going on in your mind. What's it doing? Oh my God, I can't believe I said that. I am so embarrassed. That was ridiculous. If I hadn't said that, I was doing... Does anybody's mind do that? Answer me, okay? What is the benefit of that? The answer is zero. Do you understand that? How about this? You're driving down the road, you're going on a vacation or driving to Miami, and there's a sign, a billboard on the road, and it reminds you of a relationship that you probably had with your father or your mother 25 years ago, and your mind starts reiterating the discussion as if it was going on now, or your ex-husband or whatever it is, and it's still going on in there, isn't it? What in the world is that? Of what benefit is that? Very few of you in business, in relationships, in life would allow a cost-benefit analysis to take place of which the cost is 100% and the benefit is zero and you would still do it. Correct? That's what I'm telling you that is. The cost is 100% and the benefit is absolutely zero. All it does is cause you trouble. It makes you neurotic. It makes you nervous. It makes you scared. Do you understand that? So why are you tolerating that? That's what mindfulness is about. We define a world inside ourselves that supports our self-concept, and we need that because we're hiding from ourselves behind the self-concept, right? And because we define the world that way, we need the world to be that way. Right. But the world has nothing to do with what we made up. <laughs> the world is what it is. It's, it's reality. It's, it's beating to a whole different drum. It's beating to science. It's beating, like, it's been our rain today. It's my birthday. That's stupid. What are you doing? Rain has nothing to do with your birthday. It has to do with meteorology and low pressure zones, right? So you've now left yourself vulnerable to the unfolding of reality is going to destroy you. Right. 
So that's what you were saying, and exactly. that's absolutely true. So even if I sit down and I write my list to begin the day, and then I follow that list in order to basically make myself feel less insecure, the truth is I'm more vulnerable. Yes because things may interrupt that list that I don't have control over, and then I will be sort of subject to that experience. If you are living your life to mm -hmm. hide from yourself, you're not gonna get anywhere. It starts, you asked me, how do you do this? It starts mm -hmm. when you say, I don't wanna live like that anymore. I don't want my state of being to be completely dependent upon right. somebody else's mood, upon how somebody else does or doesn't do, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know, upon the unfolding of the weather, <laughs> the unfolding of the world, right? I want to find my true being. I want to find me in here and be okay. Then I'll come into the world. It's not that you don't come into the world. Let me come into the world and be motivated by love, be motivated by compassion, be motivated by creativity, by inspiration, instead of be motivated by fear, mm -hmm. which is what we are motivated by, mm -hmm. right? Okay? It's like the most powerful of us try to stay really powerful because the thought of, I mean, some of these very powerful people, the minute they're out of office or out of this or finances go wrong, they're jumping off buildings, right or wrong. Right. It did happen, didn't it? Right. Okay? That's because they were not powerful. They were supported by something because they were needing and, and it was weak. And that strength came from conditional, by the conditional state. The moment that conditional state went away, well, it's over. I don't want to face this. Why would meditation work? What's meditation got to do with me who's in here and struggling with myself? Meditation is very, very simple in the simplest sense. The simplest meditation nowadays that's taught is 15 minutes in the morning, 15 at night, sit down and watch your breath go in and out. Well, what's so holy about watching your breath go in and out? What's that got to do with yoga? If you are watching your breath go in and out, you are not watching your mind complain about what's going on. You're not letting your mind, you're not watching the mind that is participating in the game of what do I want, what do I not want, and how do I make it happen? You are instead focusing your awareness on the breath going in and out. Believe it or not, that will completely change your life. Why? For the very reason that you're not participating in the disturbed mind. The mind will always be disturbed if the foundation of the mind is, what do I want, what do I not want, and how do I make it happen? That is very disturbing because you have pitted yourself against the unfolding of reality in front of you. If you watch your breath go in and out or any other technique of meditation, you use whatever is comfortable to you, it works for you. If you're watching your breath go in and out, you are not watching your mind live your life, decide what should be happening and getting upset or excited about it. That very act of not watching the disturbed mind permits you, you in there, the one that I said, are you in there? Hi, you're in there, but you're watching your mind all the time and participating in the mind's attempt to make things be the way it wants. Every single moment is an exciting challenge to do your best, to bring your A game to everything that's going on, right? It's like sports. I shouldn't talk about it now, but anyways, you know, sometimes we win, sometimes we lose. The question is, did you enjoy the game? Did you get better because of it? If you played a competitor that was better than you, that's wonderful, you learned. You understand that? It's the same thing with relationships. If you're in a relationship and it didn't work out, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Did you learn? Did you grow? Are you better now to move on with your life? Every single moment of life is a learning experience. Do you understand that? The point that I see, I get across to people, I say to you, you are always better. Oh, oh, I'm in trouble now. I'll step back. You are always better off having had an experience than not having had it. You are a wholer person because you had an experience. Do you understand that? If you didn't ever travel somewhere, then you didn't have that experience. If you didn't ever fall in love, you don't know anything about it. You're a novice. You're, you're nothing, right? You are, when you have an experience, when life gives you the gift of an experience, and you experience it, and you learn from it, how can you tell me you're not better off than you were before you had the experience? It can't make you worse off unless you resist the experience. Then it can really make you worse off, can it? If you don't like the experience and you resist it, it can ruin your life. But the fact that you got to have the experience is really special. It's a special thing. It's a thank you. 
This gives you a taste of how a mindful person lives. But you can't just decide to live like that because then you're going to suppress the issues you have inside. Right? You're going to come to me and say, but what if somebody dies? But what do I do if this happens? Right? You didn't catch on yet. Right? Get yourself together. Be happy inside. Be whole. Feel complete. Right? Feel love pouring up inside of you because you don't have this junk stored inside of you. Then go out and bring that into this world with enthusiasm, with passion, with love. Right? And interact with every single thing that life brings before you with a sense of honor and respect and gratitude for the right to be able to do that. You have the right to live like that. If you're a student, love going to school. Don't go to school so you can graduate and then go get a job and earn something. What, are you crazy? School is one of the neatest, especially college. That's got to be one of the neatest experiences you'll ever have in your entire life. Do you understand that? Somebody's paying for you to go and listen to smart people tell you stuff. <laughs> you don't have to go on the web and read. They sit there and tell you. Well, and what do you do? Oh, I went to sleep. Like, come on, right? You get to the point, or you, or you I can't wait to get out and meet my boyfriend. It's always about something else. The reason is because you're not okay. And if you're not okay, you can't enjoy what's happening to you. You have to be looking for the thing that will be okay, that will make you be okay. So we have the groundwork down. The problem here is that you're not okay inside. If you were okay inside, your life would be totally different, wouldn't it? You understand that? Like relationships. You're wrong if you think a relationship is supposed to make you feel love. You're wrong if you think a relationship is supposed to make you feel needed and whole and important. That's wrong. That's wrong. You're supposed to feel love to start with. That's natural. Love is part of your being. You're supposed to feel whole and complete within yourself, right? Tremendous openness and power, right? Now go out and share it with another person. That's a relationship. Don't need and then get upset because they didn't give it to you. You understand that? There's no way... Is my view. I've done it for 45 years, right? There's no way that if you can't fix what's wrong with you inside, that someone else is going to do it. They don't even know you. They got their own problems. I was CEO of a public corporation, went through all kinds of stuff. I see no difference between being in the Temple of the Universe, whatever it is, and I, I found it, kind of people started coming out there, so it happened. That's how my whole life is, right? I never decided to do anything. I just followed the energy, like I was saying. I'm there doing services, you know, meditating, whatever it is, and different events unfold. The one particular one that I tell in the surrender experiment is a, 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 a sheriff came out to the land, and I was barefoot, a hippie, you know, walking around my land, and he walked up to the temple building that we built, which I was a little concerned, you know, it has Krishna and, and Jewish things, it has all the different religions represented, and he's all dressed up in his officer uniform and pulls his big car up there, and I'm walking around barefoot, no shirt on, and he says, uh, you in charge here? Uh, and okay, yeah, <laughs> I guess I am. You know what he says? Did you build this building? I said, yes. He said, would you build an addition on my house? <laughs> I swear to God, that's exactly what happened, all right? And because I was surrendering to life, nothing inside of me wanted to build, uh, close in the garage of this sheriff, all right? I, it's like, I, I'm not even a builder. I built a couple of buildings on my own land, you know, rough sawn timber, et cetera. And I said, yes. And that founded my first company, Built With Love. And I ended up building custom houses and this and that. And then I got into computers. And the next thing I knew, people were asking me to write computer programs. And I just taught, I didn't know it took a course in my life. I just started writing, I found it interesting, like you find stuff interesting. And bought a TRS-80 Model 1 when Radio Shack first came out with the little tiny computers, <laughs> all right? And wrote an accounting pro program to run Built With Love. And then people wanted to buy the program. That's literally how this company started. And so I said, okay, I guess, all right? And then start surrendering, and then I got to write this and write that and do this. And eventually somebody asked me to write a medical billing system. And I, had, I didn't even go to the doctor in those days, and I'd never seen an insurance <laughs> form in my life, all right? And I took it, and I did it. I did it. And it became this major company, you know, with 2,300 employees and public and you know, the whole ball game. And so I just had to do it. I just did it. Well, while I was doing it, I didn't change I didn't say, now this is what I'm doing. Now this is a wonderful opportunity to let go of me. <laughs> like, you can bet, you know for sure, you can bet that being in that environment, I mean, literally, I'm on, I'm on earning calls 
with Wall Street. <laughs> like, give me a break, all right? I can't relate to any of it, but I'm doing my best. I'm serving and working hard, doing everything as an act of letting go of myself and serving the universe. I never, it wasn't about business, it wasn't about this, the other thing, but you do that, you try as hard as you can and, and just try to serve everybody and you're gonna do pretty well. When I was, you know, 22, 23 years old, <clears throat> I realized that that voice was running my life. And that's what you're saying. If it wasn't comfortable, I left. If it, you know, whatever it was, it was determining what I said, it was determining how I acted, it was determining everything about my life. And yet I didn't know a thing about that voice. Why was it saying what it was saying? Why, why is it like one person and not another? Because when you like somebody, your voice says, I like her. <laughs> so where did that come <laughs> from, right? And if all of a sudden it said, no, I don't think so. I don't think, then you don't. It's like telling you and your emotions go along with it. And it's this whole psychological system that's going on inside. So I made the decision, Not, and, and I'm not saying people should, right? But it's nice to share <clears throat> that I wasn't going to live my life without understanding what was going on because it didn't make sense, okay? And it had already caused a lot of trouble in my life, just like it does everybody else's, all <laughs> right? It's like, oh, your relationship is so hard and everything else and changing jobs. It just decides, I don't like my boss. I don't like the boss anymore. I, it's telling you that. Why didn't it just say I like the boss? Like no one actually pays attention to how much control it has over your life or why it's saying what it's saying. So what I did <clears throat> was to say, I'm gonna take a little sabbatical, hiatus, about a year or so, I, I meant to put aside, and devote my life to watching that voice and figuring out why it says what it says, what is my relationship to it, and I, in essence, dropped out. I don't like teaching that now because people shouldn't drop out. I mean, not that they shouldn't, but they don't need to. And I'm not teaching them to, right? But I did. I was, a, I, was a, I think you know, I was in a doctoral program for economics at the university. And last year, ready to get my doctorate, and I stepped aside and went into solitude, pr relative solitude. And I watched very, very carefully. And what I saw made me more uncomfortable than what you were talking about, right? Like watching it when it was in its glory, because you know, you pull yourself aside, it's going to say a lot of stuff made me realize, I don't want to listen to that thing. That thing's crazy. It just changes mind all the time. It says this, it says that. Like the reason people drink and do drugs is because that thing's driving them crazy. Do you understand that? Right? You're trying to get away from that inner mess that's going on inside. So basically, over the course of many years, I started an experiment, which was, what would happen if I didn't listen to that? What does that mean? It, it tells you what to do, and so on. Well, what if I listen to life instead? And that's very subtle. What if the events unfolding in front of me were more important than whether I liked them or not? And I was willing to listen. If I'm meeting this person, perhaps it has some meaning. The fact that I'm not comfortable with them maybe has no meaning, <laughs> right? And I started practicing letting go of myself instead of letting go of what it told me to. And, and, Sometimes it told me to do something. Sometimes I wouldn't do it. Just, and what I got was as follows. Just because it told me to do it is not going to be the reason I do it. Just because it told me not to do it is, or that it doesn't like it is not going to be the reason I don't do it. That doesn't mean that I'm doing or not doing. I will let life, the unfolding of life, the circumstances that unfold in front of me, talk to me instead of that thing talking to me. So that, that's the basics of what I call surrender. You're not surrendering to life. You're not surrendering to people. You're not saying yes to everything. You're just basically saying, my head doesn't know what it's talking about. <clears throat> it's just a bunch of noise. He's making a little allergies. It's just a bunch of noise. And I'm better off not listening to that personal noise. Doesn't mean intellectually, if I'm solving a math problem or I'm trying to decide, you know, create air conditioning or building. I, I built for a while, reading plants and so on. The mind's wonderful for that. I'm talking about the personal mind. I like this, I don't like that. I believe in this, I don't believe in that. I want this to happen. Oh my God, I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow because I'll die if it rains. That kind of junk. Just the personal noise that instead of honoring and respecting life is judging it and trying to tell me how to make life be my way instead of my respecting that life took 13.8 billion years to get here. That's, wow. that's a big shtick I have, right? That every moment in front of me 
took every single thing to happen exactly like it did for 13.8 billion years for that thing to be in front of me. Do you understand that? Yes. In other words, if, you're, if your great-great-great-grandmother didn't meet your great-great-great-grandfather, you're not here. Okay? You're trying to make your neurosis or your anxiety relax. No, anxiety doesn't know how to relax. <laughs> anxiety <laughs> is anxious. Do you understand that? It's his yep. nature, right? It's yep. all jumpy and stuff like that, yep. right? But you who's noticing it, you who has the hands in there, you can relax. You can sit there and say, okay, fine. Just relax and lean away from the noise. Just go to that place, okay? That zone, it's like a zone, right? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Athletes talk about being in the zone, yep. right? There's a zone inside. If you relax behind that noise, yeah. there's a peace back there. There's a, there's a quiet. That would mm -hmm. be a big spiritual experience, but it's a heck of a lot nicer than hanging out with anxiety. Yeah, it's the okay? observer. It's what it feels and like. You're the observer, and you relax. Yeah. And if you do that over time, not immediately, but over time, you will find that that which was making you anxious, the neurosis downstairs, oh my God, my boss is going to be mad. I told him I'd be there. I'm going to be late. He's going to be just as late anyway. <laughs> it's not going to change a thing. You look at that and you realize I'm okay. I'm okay. It doesn't do any good to show up neurotic. Okay. So you let go. And as you let go, you'll notice amazing thing. That energy that was all weird because you didn't touch it, mm. it, it changed. It was able to come up. All right. Or you start using affirmation, right? You sit there and say, oh, come on. This is probably a, 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 an older person like my grandmother, my grandpa, right? right? You do. And, yes, and, yes. And I have to get make a That's right. They get to drive and I should not be hmm. talking at them or bothering them or even sending them bad vibes. Maybe they should not be driving any faster. <laughs> well, and the point is, it's the latter part of their life and at least they get to go some places. And, go <laughs> and it means a lot more to them than this neurosis means to me. And you feel like you're giving something instead mm -hmm. of demanding and taking. You can change yourself. It's not about suppressing. It's not mm -hmm. about denying. It's about yeah. raising. You yeah. raise yourself. Pausing almost feels like it generates compassion a little bit. What you'll find out is you back there are the most beautiful thing in the whole universe. You are mm -hmm. filled with love. You're filled with compassion. You're filled with inspiration. You're filled with like well, shock the energy, just spirit, energy, call it whatever you want, filled with it all the time. But you're busy looking down at this garbage. And so you learn to raise yourself. The other example that I like to use, because I'm very much into being broad and seeing the whole universe instead of just your little tiny world, right? Yeah. Is let's say it's hot out. Nowadays, we have global warming, we're hot. Okay, it's very hot out. And you're standing there and you have to go from one place to another and you're actually outside with no air conditioning. It's not terrible. And as you're walking, you're complaining. Oh my God, it's so freaking hot and I'm sweating. I don't want to sweat. I don't like this sort of thing. And I, why does it have to be so hot? What's wrong with these people? Blah, blah. Okay. Well, yeah. that doesn't help anything. It doesn't make you cooler. It doesn't do a single thing. It's the same thing like the car. But what if you sat there? I know I, I trained Mickey this. I trained Michael this way. All right. As I sit there and I look and I say, how did it get hot? No, shh, be quiet. How did it get hot? What do you mean? Why is it hot? Well, because there's a sun out there. You mean there's a star 93 million miles away and you're, it's hot. It's so hot that you feel it's heat here. I'm in Gainesville, Florida. Miami is about 300 miles away. I asked them, well, how big would a fire have to be in Miami for you to feel it in Gainesville? If the whole town caught fire, you would not even know what happened. That thing's 93 million. You hear that, Dr. It's 93 million miles away and you can feel the star shine. Okay. Oh, wow. You can feel it's that neat. And all of a sudden you say, like that's miracle. neat. That's yeah. neat. I can feel a star. The stars are neat things, right? And you start working with yourself that way. And it works. You wow. raise yourself. And you get curious. You know, the mind is very strong. And one of the things the mind does is develop methodologies or me uh, ways of thinking that let it interact with life and not get hurt and be more comfortable. And it's the ego. When we develop a self-concept and we change it throughout our lives, but in general, there's a self-concept sitting under there saying, I was the one that did this and I was the one that went to this school and I'm the one that went there and the one that you know, my father left or stayed or whatever the hell it is, excuse me. And basically, uh, all of this unfolds and you end up developing patterns of thinking based upon the experiences you've had, all right? And what I'm saying, at least certainly in my experience, is 
that's not what makes you wake up. That's what keeps you from waking up, all right? And the fact that you're identifying with these past experiences and saying, that's who I am, well, it's not who you are. You are watching your ego. You see it get upset. You see it fix things. You see it have concepts and views and et cetera, et cetera. And even you're obviously very intelligent. You can use your intellect to support the ego, to support that, and, and so on, right? And I'm, yes, you're a very special person, a very intelligent person, and therefore that becomes part of your self-concept, okay? And then you say you're a religious person, part of your self-concept. All of these things are ways you think of yourself, and there's nothing at all wrong with that. It's wonderful. You've been successful. You're happy. You're doing well. All right. I'm not happy. Uh, okay. I'm not doing okay. well. I just said that. I'm supposed to. <laughs> I'm also like weeping openly <laughs> okay. at this moment. Okay. But listen to me. Right. That identification yes. with your personal self, which is just your yes. mind's thoughts, yes. are what keep you from waking up. We call a mindset. Is the conditioning of the mind that makes it so that things turn you on and turn you off. And that's where you get your list of what you want and what you don't want. It is not true that you want those things. What you want is something that will open you so that you can feel the joy that is natural when you're open. And you don't want the things to close you so that you get blocked off from any joy and you get this sense of depression. So you have a choice, even right at that point. And we haven't even gone deep yet. You have a choice. Do you want to spend your life deciding what you want and what you don't want, and then chasing it outside? Or do you want to sit there and work inside to realize all I really want is the joy and the love, and if I stay open, I can have those. I don't need outside conditions to keep me open. So I make a, I make a very important point because in spirituality, it gets mixed up. Spirituality is not about renunciation. There's no renunciation. Renunciation says I've decided what it is that will make me happy, and I'm not going to do it. Well, I, that sounds rather absurd, right? Spirituality says, it was stupid of me to decide what will make me happy instead of being happy with life, instead of being grateful and turned on by all of the amazing things that are happening in front of me and all the past experiences I got to have. Why don't I just enjoy all that and then come into life filled with love, filled with joy? and give the whole of my being to the moments that are unfolding in front of me. That's what spirituality says. So it's not about renunciation. It's not about things are wrong and things are right. It's about understanding that you did this. You did this with your mind. You set up conditions in which your mind would open, and then your heart opens, and conditions in which your mind would close, and your heart closes. So spirituality is very, some people will say spirituality is not logical and reason, rational. It is so. It's saying to you, why are you doing that? If you want to have a beautiful life spinning around a planet in the middle of nowhere, why don't you just open? It's your heart. It's your mind. It doesn't need conditions to open. It's just you don't know how to do it. It's you've become used to, programmed, uh, habitual, that you had a past experience. This, by the way, this is where it comes from. How did you decide? How did your mind decide what it is you want and what you don't want? You did not make those decisions. They were programmed into you by your past experiences, all of them. So you had a past experience where something was nice with a certain person, they looked a certain way, they had a certain name, they drove a certain kind of car, whatever it is, and it really was, really was high for you. It was beautiful years and years ago. Now one of those things shows up. You meet somebody with that name. As shallow as that sounds, don't kid yourself. You meet someone with the name of your ex, you close down, <laughs> even though it's not the same person. You meet someone with the name of who you had your first date with in high school, that it was a wonderful relationship, and you open up. And likewise, when you see a car they had a nice experience in, it turns you on. So you are programmed by your past experiences such that if they were good experiences, they tend to open you when something reminds you of them. When they were negative experiences, they tend to close you. And that is where you get your list of what you want. That's why all of our lists are different. Everyone's list is totally different. If someone tells you the list is the same as yours, they're manipulating you because everyone has had different experiences. And based upon those experiences, it left these impressions on your mind and you came up with this list of what I want. So when you make the list of what you want and what you don't want, you're really making a list of your past. That's how you came up with those things. Even colors that you like, anything. They are impressions. Skinner, the psychologist said, man is the sum of his learned experiences. It's not true. It's true that your mind and your heart, are the, your personal heart are the sum of your learned experiences. 
but you are in there noticing this. So I make a big distinction with BF, right? That you are in there and you are noticing that your mind is a sum of your learned experiences. And it is. That's where psychology meets spirituality. Psychology is right. All of the psyche, your thoughts, your patterns, your likes, your dislikes, your problems and, and neuroses, et cetera, are the sum of your learned experiences. But you are in there. You are the consciousness, the awareness of being who notices that what I'm saying is true. So basically, you come to the point where you have to decide, do I want to continue letting my past leave impressions on my mind and my heart such that only certain things will open and close me, and then I will spend my life chasing after, manipulating, controlling, conniving, whatever you want, the world around me so that sometimes it unfolds the way I want? Or do you want to sit there and understand that you're the one who's making these decisions? It's your mind who's setting up the conditions. Why don't you just not do that? You can start with positive thinking. That's one level that at least you should be doing that, right? You sit there and say, we'll make it through this. And even if I don't, whatever it is, I will be a better person because of this. If you're in, into God running everything, if that's your, your state, God knows what he's doing. There are so many different things that you can do with positive thinking to create a nicer environment inside. In my opinion, you have an obligation to do that, both for yourself, for the health of your body, for your people around you. You just lift yourself up. The Gita says, one should raise the self with self, not trample down the self. This is a time to be doing that work. So you can't say, I can't do that. You, you can make your mind say things. You're going to used to say, every time there's a negative thought, replace it with a positive one. It's a good time to practice that. So it's, it's woeing for itself. Oh my God, this is terrible. I'll be fine. This is okay. God knows what he's doing. Or no, this is just reality. It's just reality. You can accept it either way. And then the next level is you sit there and if you do mantra, and mantra doesn't have to be an Eastern you know, Sanskrit mantra, but just get something going behind that you're hanging on to at a deeper part of your mind. I'll be okay. This is okay. I'll use this, whatever it is, right? Then what will happen is when the lower self starts, these situations happen, you just settle back into it. So you have a choice, which mind you want to listen to, the lower mind, which we know what it's like, or you've built something beautiful inside. And then ultimately, the highest state is you relax every single time something hits your stuff, you relax, you relax, relax and let go. Relaxing itself is letting go. People sometimes say, well, I relax, how do I let go? The very fact that you chose to relax, relax your shoulders, relax your tummy, et cetera, and, and just relax inside. You, that is letting go. You're not getting all involved in what's going on. So that's the highest state is you just keep letting go. And the worse it is, the better. You just keep letting go. You just to commit yourself. I'm going to use this. All right. Then you, of course, put aside some time in the morning and evening to remind yourself that this is what I'm doing. Why don't we deal with it exactly the same inside as we deal with it outside and just sit there and say, yes, there are experiences in life that are not pleasant. Good. I like to learn from them. Doesn't mean I want to have them. I'm not praying for them, right? But if they happen to present themselves in front of me, this is my opportunity to become a greater being, to be able to handle the reality of life. There. And so that's also the thorn you talk about, right? That you can carry. You let it go. Let mm -hmm. things go. Yeah. Instead of compensating right. for them and learning how to be okay mm -hmm. that it's there, it's only there because inside... There are no thorns. There's no physical being. It's mm -hmm. etheric inside. Mm -hmm. It's completely open. Mm -hmm. okay. How hard is it for you to change your mind? Am I wrong? Right. Okay? There's nothing in there. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just, it's totally empty, right? It's just loose, right? It's looser than the clouds. So why not make it nice in there? So if something comes in and it's disturbing, yeah. I always tell people, if you went through a traumatic, terrible experience when you were young, I wish I could go down there and beat the people up and go back in time and protect you. Oh, I would love to do that. But I can't. I can't. And you can't either, and nor can anybody else, right? So I will blame the person who mistreated you or did this thing to you when you were five years old, you're an innocent child, right, for causing the that, that problem then. But yeah. they stopped. They went away. They moved. They died. You know, arrested. I don't care. It's whatever. Over. It's over. <laughs> right. But you didn't let it be over. For the next 30 years, you did it. I have to blame you for those 30 years. I can't blame them. They're not there. Mm -hmm. I can't blame the experience. It's not even happening. How dare you blame the experience that happened 25 years ago? 
you are the one who chose to keep that inside of you and let it destroy your life. I always teach this. First let go. Then if it's still there, deal with it. You're going to find out that 95% of the time, once you relax and let go, there's nothing left to deal with. If somebody walks up, you say, hey, Sally, how are you doing? She doesn't turn around and say hello, and she's your friend. Okay? No, there's, there's an experience. It's not comfortable. What's wrong? Why she didn't, you know, blah, blah. Did she not hear me? All that stuff goes on, right? Relax through it. Relax through it. Okay. Okay, fine. That's what happened. Now, what are you going to do about it? Nothing. She's not there anymore. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to do. Right? And you're crazy if the next time you see Sally, why didn't you say hello? <laughs> It's great. You won't do that because you handled it. There's no reason to say anything. What a nice person you are. Maybe she didn't hear you. Maybe she's in a bad mood. Who cares? Right? So if you are willing to let go, you're going to find out the vast majority of the time there is nothing to do about it except let go. If someone were to listen to this conversation from the seat of awareness, what, what would that be like? How would they do that? That's jumping ahead a whole lot, but let's start there, okay? You are aware. People don't pay attention to the fact that they're aware, but obviously they're aware. You see through your eyes, you hear through your ears, and you, you feel touch and, and so on. Who does that? What does that? Your eyes don't see. You see through your eyes. Your skin passes messages back to you. Your ears pick up sound vibrations, send them back to you. Who is that in there and where in there? It's not really everywhere. There's a place inside of yourself from which you listen. That's why some meditation techniques are very beautiful. They tell you to just listen, listen to quiet, listen to whatever sounds there, pay attention, listen. Then you really realize you're in there trying to listen. So basically, but, but you're, you're asking a deep question. The deep answer is you are inside and if you meditate and you pay attention and work with witness consciousness, you're gonna find out that there is a place in there where you are and that the sights that are coming in are outside of you, even inside. Your thoughts are outside of you. You'll feel that they're at a distance from you because you're sitting in a center of consciousness and then you're projecting your consciousness onto objects of consciousness. It is always highest thing you can do to harmonize with the moment that is unfolding in front of you. That goes for business, goes for relationships, goes for sports, goes for children. So many people make it so anxious to bring up a child. Oh my God, what do I need to do? Oh, it's the most natural thing in the world. Be present in the moment with each stage the child is going through and bring your best game. Not for you, but I wanted to be a lawyer. I was never, nah, don't you dare do that. You come into the moment with the child and you try to hear what they're saying, you try to see what they're going through, and you try to see how you can raise that moment to the best of your ability. That's all you can do, that's the highest thing you can do, and it will end up with the highest results that can possibly happen. You don't need to worry about it, you don't need to think about it, you don't need to feel guilty, you don't need to feel shame, nothing. You just, in the current moment, you bring your best game. What's your best game? It starts with honoring and respecting the moment that's in front of you, period. Not just accepting, that's not even enough. Loving, gratitude. I could be experiencing nothing. Somebody said to me the other day, that I remember I said this, how much of the universe is blank, empty space? 99.99999%, do you understand that? That's all there is out there is blank, empty space. You do know that, don't you? You know, I think our nearest star, Alpha Proxima, whatever it is, is what was it, 4.5 light years away. The nearest star, nothing in between. 4.5 light years away. You know how far away that is? If I caught a light beam and held it above the earth, if I let it go for one second, it just circumnavigated the earth eight times. Oh, that's a little fast, isn't it? Do that every single second for 4.5 years and you'll get to the next star. Uh, <laughs> the next galaxy is 2.4 million light years away. I mean, there's nothing but empty space everywhere. And you get to have this in front of you. That's just interesting, colors, shapes, things. So what I taught, the person repeated it to me last night, is instead of comparing what is going on in front of you against what you want, what you made up based on your past, compare it against nothing and feel gratitude. I am grateful that I get to have this experience and be that way with every single moment of your life. 
That's the highest life you can live, isn't it? That's the highest life you can live. <laughs> and you'll stop storing stuff inside of you because you'll stop saying, I don't want this. It's all exciting. It's all challenging. I'm willing to go through anything. It's just a challenging experience. It's a fun thing. And you'll become empty inside, and that becomes your spiritual growth also. As you start to embrace the moment that's in front of you with the whole of your being, you become empty. You become pure. And all this energy starts to well up inside of you. For our next foray into how to bring spirituality into the workplace and make the workplace spiritual, this is something we ran into. I was in program design for the medical industry. And so sometimes we'd have projects given to us where they wouldn't be defined at all. They'd just be, oh, I don't know how to keep my medical records in the computer. It could mean a million different things. It was early in the game when no one was computerizing medical records. Or appointment scheduling. What does it mean? What are the criteria? There were no specifications. So there are times when you are given a project that you literally don't know what to do. <laughs> it's just that simple. It's not that you're blocked, it's that you haven't had the experience. There isn't someone to turn to that has had the experience. So you bring a team together and no one in that team knows what to do. So that brings up a really interesting teaching of how to work spiritually and how the benefits of all of the deep Eastern teachings can come into the workplace. What we used to do in a situation like that is I'd bring my team together, six or seven people would sit around, all very, very high level developers. And the first criteria that I would work with is, are you all willing to admit you don't have an answer? You don't know. And I'm their boss, they don't like saying that, but you have to start with reality. Otherwise, somebody's walking into that room thinking they're supposed to have an answer. They don't, but they made something up. That is noise that just creates tremendous trouble in the workplace, in a, in a meeting, in this creative environment, all right? That somebody thinks they know, but what they really know is I want to know, and I want to impress everybody, and I'm afraid of not knowing. So it's just ego garbage. And so you don't want to bring that into the meeting. So what do you do? How do you start? Everybody's sitting there admitting, I don't know. So what I learned to do, and what I taught them, I called it the yin-yang method of design, of solving problems that you don't have the answers to. You don't know how to start, so let's start somewhere. You start with asking the question, well, what's the minimum that I could do? It's not the right answer. We're not gonna do it. Nobody's justifying it. But what is the minimum that we could do and claim that it satisfied this project that we've been given? And you talk about it. Don't design it, don't get down the detail because we're not gonna stay there. You just get a feeling of what's right about the minimum, what's wrong about the minimum. And all of a sudden, you know about this. You know why that's not enough. You can get passionate about it. You know why it won't solve this problem or that problem or satisfy one of your clients, right? And you know why you have to have at least that. We can't go lower than that, right? Because it doesn't do anything. And all of a sudden, you're having a fruitful, engaged, beautiful discussion where a minute ago, everybody was saying, I don't know anything. And all of a sudden, you realize you do know something. You do know what the minimum looks like. So you start with that, but you don't design it. You don't get down to, oh, what will we do? What will it look like? No, no, no. Just talk about what the pros and cons of this being the minimum. Find the minimum, find the lower edge. Then immediately, once you put that to rest for a moment, don't let anybody buy in. Don't say, oh, I think that's right. I'm not interested. This is not about whether you like it or don't like it. It's about admitting this is the least we could do, and here's the pros and cons of that. Then. Go to the expansive. What's the most you could do? What's the most you could do? There is a most you could do. You know, it could take you three years to do it. But given that situation that you're talking about, just let your mind go. What is the most that you could do? You know, going beyond that would be ridiculous. There'd be no way you'd need to. There'd be no way you'd want to. What is the outer edge of what this project could look like? All right, if you really just expanded it into what's the most it could mean. The main obstacle is the unwillingness to experience what it feels like to go through withdrawal. What is the obstacle for a person getting off of hard drugs or getting off of alcohol? They could be very committed. They said, I want to do it, right? But there is that tendency that you have habits, you have 
you have tendencies. And to let these go require a certain amount of commitment and a certain amount of strength of center of will that I really am committed to this. And then you go through this process of withdrawal, this process of purification. It isn't comfortable, but you have to want the result more than you're afraid of the discomfort. So I always tell people, it's not about whether you like something or not. It's a question of whether you can handle it. Don't ask yourself, do I like this or not? Ask yourself, can I handle this? And it's a rhetorical question because you better be able to because the alternative to be able to handle something is you can't handle it. And I don't want to be around, nor do you, <laughs> right? So you just, that we're talking about that center of will, that center of volition. You sit in there and realize, I got junk inside of me. I've developed patterns that are not healthy, just like drugs. I mean, I'm not saying that you're doing drugs, right? But it's, it's like a drug. It's like alcohol. You have these patterns of reactions that are just got formed inside of you when you weren't paying attention. And now you need to let them go. So the obstacle is your unwillingness to go through what it takes to let it go. The moment you decide, I want out. I want to let this go. And there's two reasons to let it go. One is the non-negative because it sure caused you a lot of trouble all that noise in there. And the other is the positive. Both are fine. I want to let it go because I want to have a reasonable life. I want to let it go because I want to have one life to live. I want to experience the highest I can possibly experience. I want to explore the depth of my being. I want to know what Christ meant when he said, my father and I are one. I want to know where Buddha went with nirvana. Whatever level you feel the positive, right? And you... Both of those, the inspiration of the non-negative and the inspiration of the positive, should give you the drive, the, the inspiration, the intention that you need in order to say, I'm letting go. I'm letting go. Because the alternative is, is absurd. The alternative is to give my life to the lowest part of my being. There are so many situations in our everyday experiences and work that are just excellent opportunities for growth. So for example, you find yourself in a meeting and there's a group of people and they're sharing ideas and their views. The first thing I want to talk about is if you watch, what you're going to realize is you're not really listening. You're doing one of two things. And this goes even not just for meetings, just even in conversations when you just sit there talking to somebody. Either when they're talking and you're supposedly listening, what you're actually listening to is your own view of what they're saying. You're listening to the voice inside your head say, well, I, I never did anything like that. I wonder why. Yeah, I, I wouldn't want that to happen to me either. And no, 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 I wouldn't say it the way you said it. I would, but, and you're in there talking. The voice inside your head is talking and you're actually paying as much, if not more, attention to your opinion, view, judgment, whatever it is, extensions, add-ons, and subtractions to what's being said than you are paying attention to the words coming out of the person's mouth. And that's if you're actually listening. What happens very often in a meeting, and I see it all the time with people, <laughs> right, is they're not even listening to what anybody's saying. They're thinking about what they're going to say when it's their turn. That's all that's going on inside their head, is they're just thinking about, oh, how do I formulate that? That's unbelievable. I, can't, I shouldn't even have to talk on that. <laughs> if you're doing that, you don't belong in the meeting. Because the purpose of the meeting is we're all different. We're all different. We all have different stuff inside of our heads because we've all had different experiences in life. We've all had different experiences and we process them different ways. Therefore, the data that we have for the foundation of our thoughts is completely different than everybody else in that room. Even if you work together for 20 years, still your background, your upbringing, what happened outside of work, all of these things formulate the way you think. So when you walk into a room with a meeting, you understand that what you have is a whole bunch of data sets. And every one of those data sets is correct. There's not one of them that's more correct than the other. If I look out a window, everybody looks out the window but looks at different angles, there's nobody who's seeing it right. <laughs> They're just seeing what's out there is bigger than any one thing you can see. So no person has gone through life experiencing what's there. All they experienced what was in front of them from moment to moment. So therefore, everybody is right. Everybody has a different experience of life. Therefore, everybody has something to contribute. If criticism creates reaction inside, which of course it does, like you said, in most people, then are you willing to, Ram Dass used to say, use it to go to God. I always love that. I keep that with me. Are you willing to say, hey, I bothered meditating. You told me all these intense practices you did. It's fasting, this all. You've read all stuff I used to do, right? Here it is. Here's a moment where the very thing that is keeping you from the ascent has shown its face to you, are you willing to use that for your spiritual growth? 
and that has to be deep, deep inside. And the answer is yes, of course I am. Okay, then you need to bring these energies up. What happened there when you got hot and the energy got hot and the breath went faster, the snippy comments is that basically it, it hit a blockage. It hit a blockage, expanded it out. And so basically what your willingness to do is to say, I can stay centered in the midst of that blockage and I can relax. So the key is relaxing. You're right, we didn't talk about that because letting go, those are just words. The key is, can I relax in the face of the reaction? And when people come to me and say, well, the anger won't relax. Well, of course not. Anger doesn't know how to relax. Defensiveness doesn't know how to relax. But you who is experiencing, I love You obviously were talking to me from a place of witness consciousness because you described to me what it felt like to have that reaction. That meant you were in there noticing it. You who notices it wants to do something about it to make it stop. That's why you have these snippy comments. That's why you attack or whatever, or run away, whatever it is, right? Fight or flight, right? No. What you need to do about it is relax. If you will relax instead, you gave it some space to release. So you're absolutely right. It is not breathe and let go. That doesn't mean anything. Breathe means something. But let go, those are just words. They don't mean a single thing. What it means is catch your breath for a moment, make a commitment. I want to use this to go to God. I want to use this for my spiritual growth. I want to use this to liberate myself from myself. All right? There. Now you have your intention. Now I'm asking you to relax. It's not easy. You'll see the energy tries to pull you into it, right? That's what it's trying to do, right? It tries to pull you in to get you to feed the reaction. Instead, you relax. And just the very act of relaxing leaves some space for a little bit of it to pass through. The more you relax, the more you lean away from the energy that's making all the noise, the more space you leave. And that's a very, very deep spiritual practice, to relax and release. I call it R&R, to relax and release everything all the time. First, let go. That's what I mean by let go. Relax and release. Now, deal with the situation. Don't deal with your reaction. Instead of looking at the decision you're trying to make, ask yourself, what are you trying to get from this decision? What's your motive? What you're going to find out is every single time it is either I'm trying to make a decision that will make me feel better, make me happier in the future, let me achieve a better state inside myself where I'm more content, and more excited, more enthused, you know, feel higher, etc. Or I'm trying to make a decision that will save me from having to experience something that I don't want to experience. Which way can I choose this so it's a path of least resistance? So you find that the motive behind your decision as opposed to getting all involved in the decision, you step back and say, what am I trying to achieve? And you're going to see that it's either a desire or a fear. You're trying to achieve a desire by moving to New York or moving to California, which won't work for me, right? You're trying to make your mind be psychic to figure out which one will make you happier versus I'm trying to avoid a situation that I don't want. And then you take a look at that and you realize what I'm really trying to decide is how to be happy inside, how to be in a better state inside myself. Well, why don't I say that honestly? It's not really about this decision. It's about how can I find a more beautiful state state inside myself. And that's where it leads to yoga. That's where it leads, everything leads to spirituality. Because it says, the state you're looking for is inside yourself. What in the world has it got to do with where you live or what your job is or who you marry? It's got to do with how you're doing inside yourself. Why don't you work on that a little bit instead of trying to put the burden on your mind of thinking that some decision you're going to make down the road is going to decide the quality of your life. Because the truth of the matter is the state of your being is going to determine the quality of your life. If you're whole, if you're complete, if you're enthused, if you're filled with love, it doesn't matter which place you live in. You're going to be wonderful. And if you're disturbed inside, it's not California or New York that's going to make the difference. It does for a short period of time because it's new and therefore you're more open to it. So you step back behind the decision and you look to see where you're coming from. And at some point, if you come deep enough at looking at that, you'll realize I have put a burden on my mind of saying this is going to determine the quality of my life. And it's not true. You're going to determine the quality of your life. So at least come back to that center, that deep center inside that undercuts all this. Then you're going to find out that you don't put the pressure on yourself for that decision. And often it will unfold naturally. It doesn't mean you don't make a decision, not indecision, but you'll find that if you make get rid of the noise inside of you, you'll be able to see more clearly what is actually happening and what is maybe a better way to serve, a better way to balance the energies as opposed to how can I make myself happy with this decision or how can I avoid my fears with this decision. The highest life you can live is that every moment that passed in front of you is better off because it did. Every moment, because it passed in front of you, you interacted with a way that when it went on its way, it was higher than before it passed before you. That's St. Francis's prayer, isn't it? Make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there's sickness, let me bring health. Where there's sadness, let me bring joy. Not let me take from the moment. When you're, when you're not okay inside, you're taking, you need, you're taking. When you're okay inside, you're giving to the moment, you're raising the moment, not according to what you think should be happening in accordance to what you're hearing the moment bring to you. It talks to you. That's not mystical. If there are storm clouds up ahead 
and you see sheets of rain in a distance. Life is telling you it is probably going to rain where you are. That's literally, Christ said, let those who have eyes to see, let them see, let those who have ears to hear, let them hear. In other words, come on, get out of your head and pay attention to what's going on in front of you. That's all you need to do. That's all you need to do. It will tell you everything you need. It will give you an idea where it's going, give you an idea where it's coming from, give you an idea what it needs on its journey, and you become a servant. You become a servant of the moment that's in front of you, and then you let it go. Let it go. How many of you have conversations with somebody, and then when the conversation's over and you walk away, the conversation's not over inside your head? Oh, I shouldn't have said, oh, if only it said this. Oh my God, oh my God, he probably said I'm so stupid. I should call him. No, don't call him. They really look stupid. <laughs> what is that? You're missing the next moment because you're being neurotic about the last one. So you can't possibly be doing the best you can. Do you understand that? Because there's literally a moment unfolding in front of you while you're doing that. You're obviously missing that moment, aren't you? Because you're caught in the last one. You should have the ability to have a conversation, be present in the conversation, absolutely do the best that you can in that conversation to raise it. And if it's business, you can raise it for, you know, to do the best in business. If it's relation, we raise it best for love. Nobody's saying you're not interacting with it in harmony with its purpose. But basically when it's over, I'm telling you, it's over. All that stuff you do of causing yourself a hard time and building all that junk inside, that's not helping. It doesn't help one iota. It just makes you more neurotic. So basically you let go, then you come present the next moment and you just live in the harmony of the moment. And you give yourself to it. That is what Lao Tzu meant by the Tao. And if you ever studied the Tao, he called it the way. The way, the way of life. The way of that is all of Zen. That is all of everything. It's all of martial arts. It's all of sports. Why do you think they teach football players and other people to meditate? It's because this state of openness, this state of harmony with what's going on will give you that edge instead of being caught in your mind. So life is beautiful. No one will tell you that. All of life is beautiful. Birth is beautiful, death is beautiful, everything's beautiful, except that you make it not be beautiful because you've made up how you want it to be. Your house is beautiful. You're the one who makes it not beautiful because you think it's not big enough because you wish the color would change because you know the neighbor next door got a nicer one. Everything is beautiful if you interact with it with a sense of respect, with a sense of honor, with a sense of being. And what is amazing that if you do that, I don't even know how to talk about it, but purpose of my second book, the Cerner Experiment, was that somehow just by doing that, what unfolds is way higher than anything you could ever do. All you can be responsible for is yourself. Your starting position is, right, you have to evolve with the different situations that are presented to you. And my experience is, if you do that, the rest will happen. The people around you will be raised naturally. Understand mm -hmm. that. Like if you bring anger into a situation, Imagine a household where everyone's always fighting. If all of a sudden somebody's not and somebody's bringing understanding and love, that's all they have to do. It will change things, right? But you you can't sit there and say, I won't change it until everybody else does. You know, I'm going to protect myself. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. That's the nothing, chicken nothing and the egg. Change. Right. So that you're asking you, like, you're so surprised. You're asking such big things, right? It's like, can it be better? Of course it can be better, but it requires that everybody work on themselves because while they're not working on themselves, they're working on everybody else. <laughs> they're just trying to manipulate. Because you made it this far in a video, I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you are different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end, and I love you. So it's a special celebration if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video, I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. For some incredible Bruce Lipton motivation, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. One of the things that really upset me for a long time was the fact that I had great ideas and intentions and I wanted to manifest them and I thought this is how it's going to manifest and so I had all these visions of how things were going to unfold and then I'd start a process and it wouldn't unfold.